I don't know if you noticed that. I've been, do I've been doing all the photography for Tim all morning, and I've been reduced to doing a selfie for myself. It's terrible, isn't it? I'm, I'm one of those skinny vegans. Um, so uh, I remember getting arrested in the 1980s, and this uh, copper said to me, uh, are you vegetarian? And my instinct was to say no. And he goes, oh, I could tell that because you're not skinny enough. But then when I got down to the police station, I had to explain that I'm actually vegan. So that was quite an interesting one. Right, we'll just uh, give it a minute or so. I think it's uh, about a minute to go. Okay, so this is the time we're supposed to get. I was actually supposed to be doing two presentations, uh, but I ended up uh, having to fill in this morning. So uh, the, the one about the grassroots is, is gone. So this is going to be uh, mainly the hour on, on this. So I'll give us plenty of time for Q&As, which will be quite good, because th this is a quite a good uh, topic on that. You've seen people do those kind of fancy TED shows, right, where they've got sophisticated equipment to change the slides. Well, I've, I've got a mouse. Attached to, to, to the uh, to the computer, so uh, it has the same effect. Okay, well, uh, my name's uh, Roger Yates. Uh, been a vegan activist since uh, the late uh, 70s. Um, but I know you've been thinking that you know there's a lot of good food in the festival, comedy, drinks, etc. What's really been missing is sociology, right? So th this is what this session's all about, and that will kind of balance things out a little bit. I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers, particularly Alan and Tim, who put together this incredible show and uh, organized the entire team. Okay, so really we're looking at a snip. We're going to try and lift the lid on the title, you know, how do we become animal-loving animal users? Try and lift the lid on that. We can't really delve into it too much, but um, this is a little snippet then from my research work. And you can see there on the top there, particularly a chapter called the Species Barrier Maintenance. If you'd like to actually read that, the easiest way to get into it is if you Google Roger Yates Social Construction. Usually that comes up. Obviously, I'm going to be showing you a PowerPoint. And just picking out a few texts from that, just a few highlighted things. So if you want to see the full one, at the end, if it's uh, intrigued you enough, then if you email me, roger.yates at ucd.ie. UCD is the University College of Dublin, so that's where I'm an occasional lecturer. What we're really doing then with this thing is going into something that's very basic in sociology, which is the processes of socialization. Um, although it's a basic concept within the discipline, as you can see here, it can get quite complicated. These are the agents of socialization. We'll be sticking really to the bit at the top in the middle there, kind of family socialization. When we talk about socialization in sociology, we tend to split it up into two things. We talk about primary and then secondary. There, there is a concept called adult socialization, but mainly we talk about primary and secondary. So we're going to be in that kind of basic kind of area. What we really mean, though, because we make some big claims about socialization, is it's the process by which we become members of society, how we become citizens. It's how we learn the norms and values and the attitudes of our society. There is an aspect to it, though, which is the fact that we learn to conform to those norms and values as well. And in fact, sociologically, one interesting thing is that most people are conformists in a sociological sense. We tend to conform to basic ideas of our own society and our own culture as we're born into it. 
Even people who self-identify as radical, if you, as it were, scratch between the surface, you'll find that there's quite a lot of conformity in their basic core views which they learn as children. The uh, top le uh, left there, you'll see that's the secondary socialization, people like McDonald's. These are the corporations, the kind of peer things, the things that people see, kids see on the, the radio or um, on the TV and the internet. Uh, bottom there on the right, that's gender socialization. And then the one on the left there at the bottom is a very kind of basic uh, traditional idea in sociology. The idea that social institutions are pouring the norms and values of society into the heads of children. And that means, of course, that socialization is a generational thing. Our norms and values of society are transmitted generationally. And then, then the last thing on this is this uh, slide shows us two things. First, it's seen as a problem if children are not socialized. So you get kind of, as it were, wild kids, unsocialized um, children. And in fact, the education system is often seen as the mechanism for which society kind of knocks kids into shape if the family have not done it in the first place. And then in terms of socializing agent, then in a conventional sense, it's not, it doesn't apply to everybody, obviously. In a conventional sense, you're talking about the first job is mum. She is the main socializing agent in a kind of conventional sense. And we are talking about very basic things, how to use a knife and fork and how to go to the toilet, this kind of thing. Human beings, when we are born, we're helpless beings. We pretty much can't do m much except for suck and push things out of the other end. But we, we, uh, you know, we learn pretty quick. And so we have to have these agents of socialization. So what's really going on is this. The transmission of society's norms and values, society's culture, and that is transmitted generationally. OK, so I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But in terms of our focus, when I have more time and a different audience, uh, a non-vegan audience, if you like, I would give out pencil and paper, and I would just ask people, without any more cues or clues, will you please draw me a farm? And generally speaking, this is what I get back. It's not as good as this. Uh, usually a line drawing of this kind of thing. The only people who don't draw this are animal advocates. I did a, a talk at my university in North Wales a few years ago, and there was two animal advocates in the, in the audience, and they drew battery cages and sow stalls and, and slaughter lines. Everyone else drew this. And so there's some kind of common themes that we get. And of course, what people are doing is they're drawing on those early learning books that they experience as kids. So the, the themes, and this is the main one, is this is a pretty happy place. And so this is the kind of mind's eye farm for a lot of people in two ways. This is either the farm that they know about or the farm that they want to know about, even if they know other things as well. So if you're an animal advocate on the street and you talk about the use of other animals in farming, the chances are people are going to think about this. This is their cultural resource to answer you. This is what they think of in terms of animal farming. So it's a happy place, all free range beings there, and uh, there's no cages. The uh, other animals are said to have homes. They have adventures out in the field, and then they come home, and uh, they are there with their family units. That's another main theme. You've got family units, family groups. In fact, it's usually a bit more elaborate than this. Here we've got ducks and ducklings, but normally we've got chickens and, uh, and chicks and uh, horses and, and foals, etc., cows and calves. Usually, there's a lot of that, all smiling, all going back to their home after a day of adventures with their family and everything is kind of hunky-dory. From an animal rights point of view, you don't have this. In either the pictures that people produce or the books from which they are using as a resource, there is no suggestion of slaughterhouse trucks. They're not going to arrive. So this is a, a, a concept that we'll come back to a little later on the issue of kind of end use. There's no suggestion of end use here. You know, it's just the fact that here you have a farm full of other animals, they all have a great time, and that's the end of the story. Okay, so we'll come back to that. 
just want to put on some issues then, going back to sociology, but I'm actually using um, some work from a uh, psycholinguistic professor, Stanley Sapon here. But he's, he's looking at the generational transfer of, of culture and norms and values. And he does it in a general sense, but he also looks at how our relationship with, with other animals, other sentient beings. The important part is the bit that's picked out in white. Now, this is North American culture. And children are taught to be kind to one another, to be kind to animals, to abhor cruelty of any sort, that violence is not the way to resolve conflicts, and the taking of life is wrong. Now, normally, that creates a few kind of smirks in the audience because we talk about North American culture and you think, what? You know? But the interesting part about that and part of my story is that this is the initial thing that the children are taught. And essentially, what Sapon is talking about is what happens when a little bit of reality comes in. That's, that's where it, it becomes interesting. But what we get, according to Sapon, is a kind of package of norms and values. He calls it a syllabus. And of course, again, they're passed on generationally. This is the kind of power. Sociologically, the most powerful things in our lives are the things we don't particularly have to think about. You know, like easygoing oppression, easygoing speciesism, even easygoing racism. If, if things are like that, unsaid, unspoken about in your society, then they're powerfully within you. It's kind of like we internalize those values. Once people internalize social values, they become part of that person, and that means it's quite hard to shake them then. And of course, we vegans are in the shaking of values business. Okay, so he says that eventually we kind of had to cue our kids into the fact that society is not quite as rosy as we first told them. In fact, some of the values of real society violate the values that we've just spoken about. And in fact, the violation of those values are often celebrated. So in some senses, this is a problem. And certainly, psychologically, can't be beneficial, Sapham says. And effectively, what he says is that we've got a two-tier value system. We have the kind of goodness and light at the beginning, and then we gradually cue our kids in to the reality. Now, this is a general thing. It's not just about our relationships with other animals. We also do it in relation to, say, sexual violence and uh, lots of other kind of issues. Parents protect their kids from knowledge. Okay, so we tend to think, well, we'll tell them this, and then when they're old enough to know, we'll tell them that. It's kind of a natural thing to do as parents. We protect our kids in that way, and we also do it in relation to our use of other animals. So this is about the only thing I'm going to read out. It said that adults typically raise children from birth to five or six years in a kind of fantasy land of ideal behavior on the part of the world's inhabitants. In this land of goodness and mercy, other animals are humanity's friends and vice versa applies. So this is the kind of vision that we get initially. And when Sapin looked at the publications, from which people draw those pictures that I talked about, then he finds the same, the same pattern. There's no kill lines, there's no slaughter. And in fact, generally speaking, in a very overt sense, you don't see in these early learning books other animals being eaten uh, or on the plate in an overt sense of that's what it is. You might see pizza, pizza being eaten or you might see hamburgers, but you don't necessarily understand that you're dealing with a dead body, essentially. So this is Sapon's research question, which is of interest to us, because what indeed does happen when we kind of move from that fantasy land and we start to learn that actually some of our values in society are not so good. What's really going on is that we're moving from being moral patients into being moral agents. Now, this is quite important for us. In the animal rights sense, we are already involved with a lot of animal exploitation before we're moral agents. We're already involved. We're already eating them. We're already wearing them. We're already using the cosmetics and medication. We're already involved. We're already there. And then we become moral agents, and we can think about moral issues. And then you think, ah, 
right? Some part of what goes on is that when people go vegan, they kind of have to admit that hitherto, they've been making moral error upon moral error until then. And then they kind of have to, have to deal with it, in a sense. What Sabin is saying, as I suggested, is that there is a reconditioning that goes on. Really, we're queuing people in to adult life. And what he says about adult life is it's full of denial. Now, one thing we do know about human beings, there's an extensive literature on this, is that we are very good at denial. Going all the way back to Freud and onwards, we are very good at denial. We know how to deny things. There's lots of cases, some very disturbing cases, where people do things and then they deny that they've done it afterwards. Some really kind of dis disturbing things. We're really good at this. I've got a chapter in my work about denial where it's something that we shouldn't underestimate. It's very important. So this is what goes on. We're transforming other animals from this fantasy people into objects of utility, as Sapin puts it. In other words, we start to cue our kids in that we use other animals in a variety of ways. And so we might do that by just talking about categories. For example, we might use the category pets to talk about a particular type of use. We might then talk about the ones that we eat. We can talk about the ones that we wear. We can use categories like wildlife or vermin. And so we are kind of cueing our kids in to the fact that our relationship with other animals is far more complicated than what was initially kind of taught to us. And in some senses, kind of deal with that and also kind of eat your food. And another general kind of psychoanalytical point is that society is full of denial, which means that in some senses we do kind of lie to ourselves. So adults lie to themselves. We also lie to other people and we lie to our kids. From a psychoanalytical point of view, that's actually common and it's actually understandable. It's a functional thing to do. Being absolutely totally truthful all the time would be quite a hard thing to do. We often say that knowledge equals power, but there's a very real sense that knowledge also can equal pain. And the animal advocates here who make it their business to kind of give out literature will know about this because in some senses, if you try to give somebody a leaflet on the street, you're kind of potentially giving them some pain if it's only psychic pain. If you flip it around the other way and you're the recipient and there's an animal advocate coming for you and you go, okay, this person's trying to give me some information. Am I gonna welcome this information? Maybe I'm not, maybe this is not gonna be a story that I want to hear much about. Maybe this is something that I would like to stay fairly kind of pushed away. You know, it's a very real thing. Carol Adams talks about it with a fairly famous concept called the absent referent. I don't know if you've heard of the absent referent, but essentially one example of that would be when we go into a restaurant, we don't order a dead body. We order a steak. But by saying steak, that is the socially sanctioned way of ordering a dead body. Okay, that's, what, that's what's going on. We are ordering a part of a dead body, but we call it a steak. And so there's an, an, the actual reference is absent. An example of that, when, when I started volunteering with the VIP here on my T-shirt, Vegan Information Project in Dublin, we were given permission to do some stalls in Temple Bar, which is a very famous kind of touristy place in uh, Dublin. I'm sure some of you have been there. And our stall was pretty close to a hamburger bar. And they complained to the people who gave us permission in the first place. And we said, but we don't have any graphic photographs on the stall, which is true. We don't. But we were missing the point because it doesn't need graphic photographs. What was going on is that they're eating, eating their hamburgers and looking over at pictures of farm animals. And it's making the connection again. It's bringing back the absent referent. The thing that they have scrupulously and very carefully pushed away, the animal part of their hamburger, is being brought back into their consciousness. And we do know that vegans, just being in a room sometimes, is uncomfortable. Because if people know you're a vegan, they, you bring back, by your very presence, the absent referent. 
you're bringing back the issue that people have very carefully pushed away, that people are in denial of. So if people react to you in that negative way, these are the reasons why. These are the reasons why they're not comfortable about you being there. You don't have to say anything. Just you being there is enough. If they know you're a vegan, then it can be a problem. So people don't want to know, necessarily. People say all the time, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. You've probably seen this in your family or whatever. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. It'll spoil my dinner. Very, very common thing. So what is it better to know? Because in the literature, it's interesting, there are other things to do with knowledge than know it. Say that again. There are other things to do with knowledge than know it. We cannot know things. And there's a couple of ways that works. We can actually physically not know, or we can kind of know a little bit and then say, okay, I know about that now, I'll move on. You know, don't tell me about the third world starving, the developing countries and food, food security. I know all that. You know, I, I, I got the Live Aid DVD. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I'll, mo I'll move on. So it's a kind of shallow understanding. So you don't really fully know. So what's better to know? We're back to the books. This is one of the books that I looked at in my research, Tales from Mud Puddle Farm. As you can see here, there's a, an entire community of other animals and uh, two human animals, the farmers, Farmer Rafferty. What's going on in this book is a really cozy social contract, a reciprocal kind of thing going on. And it's summed up by that bottom bit there, if you can see it. You look after me, and I'll look after you. That's what the farmer says to the other animals. You look after me, and I'll look after you. How that plays out in the story is really fascinating. What you've got is there are free-range hens on this farm, and they lay their eggs for the farmer. It's almost like this is the rent they pay. And, you know, farmers will actually say this to us, you know? They don't do it to reproduce their species. They don't do it for, for themselves. They don't do it just because it's biological. They do it for the farmer. And in particular, there are two cows on the farm, and they let their milk down for him. This is interesting, as though they could keep it up as one thing. But what's interesting on this level, there are no calves on this farm, just adult cows who provide milk for the farmer. There's no issue about pregnancy. There is no tapping into mammalian biology. We might know this as vegans. Isn't it strange that there are so many people out there in society, they don't seem to know that they're mammals and what that means, including women. They don't know what it means to be a mammal. And so they say that cows just give milk. They give milk for life. But they know that they couldn't do that. You know, they would dry up, you know? But they don't transfer that to other mammals. And part of that is the fact we're in denial again. We don't self-identify as animals. If people call you an animal in the street, they're insulting you, right? We don't self-identify as mammals. And we certainly don't self-identify as apes, do we? Again, if somebody called you an ape, now, if somebody called me an ape, I should say, yeah, no. But we don't. We see it as an insult, right? So that's what's going on in this situation. Very cozy social contract where the other animals work along with the farmer. Now, just to bring this back, this issue came back into my consciousness a few years after the research in a kind of weird and unusual place, and it was this came back as a McDonald's Happy Meal. And in fact, there's a YouTube of the illustrator talking about this, and he's kind of going, wow, you know, I did the illustrations for this book, and now McDonald's have, have done it on, on the Happy Meal. You know, how fab is that, as it were? But I was thinking, wow, there's a bit of a disconnect there, isn't there? You know, somebody draws pictures of happy animals, and now there's bits and pieces of animals in this box. But in fact, it is actually quite easy to think about. And the real key to it is the word happy. So we've got other animals on happy farms. And what better to perpetuate this myth than that they find themselves in a happy meal? 
So everything is happy right from birth to slaughter, which is never mentioned in the first place. So it's not particularly difficult to think that these other animals find themselves on the cover of a McDonald's Happy Meal. It's not as shocking as we might initially think. Okay, this is some other, just to finish off really, some other publications that I looked at. Some of the very basic ones are really kind of getting the kids, you know what they do, they, you get the kids to, what, what do animals say, you know, what does a cow say, what does a dog say, that, that kind of thing. However, the narrative of these books can get quite complicated fairly quickly. The one in the middle there, Nubbins of the Tractor, that's a fascinating book. It's about animal property. It's about the transfer of animal property from one human being to another. And that taps into the fact that culturally, other animals are things. In law, there are two categories, persons and things. They are things. They are items of property. We can kill our animal property so long as we don't cause unnecessary suffering, which is a cornerstone of animal welfare, we can kill our pets, we can kill our animal companions, we can do it ourselves, so long as we don't cause unnecessary suffering. Normally what we do is take them down to the vet once we're fed up of our living ornaments. So, what happens in the story is that the farmer buys a tractor. This makes Nubbins the horse redundant. And so Nubbins is going to be sold. And the son doesn't like that. And so he says to his dad, can you transfer the ownership of Nubbins to me? Which he does. And then the, the tractor breaks down. And so that means that suddenly Nubbins is needed again to work on the farm. And the end of the story is you've got the son, now the animal owner, and the owned, happy as Larry, going back to work on the farm. You know? So there is actually quite an interesting narrative going on there. The uh, Four Ways Farm, it's an kind of entire community of other animals. Humans don't seem to appear there at all, as though they just live there and have their adventures, etc. When we get into the teenage market, we're back into categories now. Um, this is uh, Animals and You. It's kind of like a poppy kind of magazine. It's aimed at teenage girls or young women. And they're really into the categories game. Most of it is about pets. Most of it is about the other animals that are categorized as pets. Free living beings get a mention too. And actually, farmed animals do get a mention, but only as food. So what you would get, say, there's a Christmas ed edition, and the question there is, um, what should we have for Christmas lunch? And the answer is, well, we'll have the traditional turkey and all the trimmings. So the image there that you get is of the child and the pet enjoying the unnamed farm animal. Now, again, playing with the categories that we've come to understand. Some of them we use as pets, some of them we use as food. Some of them we use to uh, wear. And finally, we've got Market Day. This is like a board game. It's a bit like Monopoly. And the players in Market Day are farmers, and they rush around the board, having all kinds of adventures, and they win. You know, each farmer is a winner once their farm is full of other animals. There's no questioning issue about why would they do that? What are they going to do with it? So there's no end game again. It's as though culturally, well, we're dealing with farmers here. What do farmers do? They fill their farms with, with their animals. That's what they do. So this is what this game is all about. Quite an interesting kind of issue in the sense that end use, again, culturally, is absent. You know, why spoil the game? by getting them to take them to slaughterhouse. And so we're trying to lift the lid on this question then, how do we end up in this state? And the sociological answer is that we're born into a culture in which this is the norm. We're born into the culture where it's said to us that you can love animals and you can eat them, you can love animals and you can use them, you can love animals and they can be used in vivisection laboratories, etc. You can even love them and hunt them. Okay? This is a, a cultural thing. And the kind of categories help because we know that there are some we use as pets. The ones who are designated as pets 
their use is to be petted and to be loved. The ones designated as food, their use is to be eaten. Which is why sometimes in some horrible, filthy, disgusting foreign land, some people make categorical errors, don't they? And they start frying and boiling up the cats and the dogs. And all the people in Britain and elsewhere, they go rather upset about that because they're doing it to the wrong types. That's the problem there. And so you get all this racist stuff coming out. You know, the damn Chinese and the damn Japanese and everything else because they are using other animals which our culture says is wrong. Really, they're just using them. I mean, in Japan, for example, foxes are seen as sacred. We, we hunt them, you know? So that kind of lifts the lid on this question. And it shows that we are born into a deeply speciesist society. That is our job. As animal advocates, as vegans, we have to challenge cultural speciesism. If we don't, we'll never win. We can't win so long as the culture of our society is deeply speciesist. It's not about individual butchers or vivisectors, it's about the culture. We have to find a way of shifting the culture to, to, make, to make it not acceptable anymore to teach our kids that they can be animal-loving, animal users. Okay, is there any uh, comments or questions, please? Yeah, all of those. Um, I mean, the thing is, uh, there are a lot of kind of long-standing vegans, like, for example, a friend of mine called Ronnie Lee. He's been vegan since 1971, right? Um, he's very critical of non-active vegans, you know, who are just vegan. Now, I tend to think that people who are just vegan, to use that phrase, um, even if they only mean it in a dietary sense, they're kind of campaigning every time they, they have a meal. I see them as kind of campaigners. Um, but I think the real issue is to understand, first of all, the origins of veganism, which is very radical. The original pioneers of the vegan society in the 1940s were very radical. They, they looked like kind of pottering around doing farming and a bit of gardening or something like that, but they were very radical. They formed the vegan society based on non-violence and peace at the time of the Second World War. They were conscientious objectors, so they saw the vegan society as part of the peace movement. And they also saw it as part of the moral evolution of humanity. So to come back to your question, is anything that can kind of spread that message, that can talk about the fact that there is a different vision. So if that's, if that's contained in your leaflets, and that's contained in your talk, that's the main thing. You know, um, I'm a grassroots advocate, and I think that what our real business is is to be active within our own communities, talking to people about change, about possibilities, and about, I don't know, the vegan utopia of the future, whatever you want to call it, because there is a utopian element to veganism, let's face it. But, yeah, we do it through all those things. We can talk about it, we can give leaflets out, we, we can do anything. I, I tend to think that uh, there's a lot of controversy about um, single-issue campaigns, right? Well. I tend to make a difference between single-issue campaign and single-issue event. I tend to think that most single issues can be abolitionized. You know, even Gary Francione, he denies it, but he actually believes that as well. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. What you can do then is present, say, opposition to a circus within an overarching vegan philosophy. The vegan philosophy is about justice for all. It's not just about health. It's not just about other animals. It was always, always from the beginning, it was about our relationships with other animals, our relationship with the planet, and our relationship with each other. It was never about all the things that people try to reduce it down to now. Because a lot of people are trying to make veganism saleable and kind of digestible and say, oh, it's just about food. You know, there's one guy who goes around, he's called the vegan strategist of all things, telling people our movement is about food. No, bullshit. It never has been. Our movement is about justice. It's about non-violence and it's about doing what's right. That's what our movement is about. 
And it's about shifting the paradigm and making a change in the culture. Anyone else? Yo. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't say the power. I said I said that. Well, I said that in culturally, it's a power. Yeah. Um, it's it, it's a difficult one that one uh, because obviously we can engage people, but then again, most people say the worst time to talk about veganism is during a meal, for one thing. Um, I used to know, still know, a playwright called G. F. Newman, um, and he wrote uh, Judge John John Dee. I don't know if people have seen that. And um, He's been a vegan for years, and he won't. In fact, when, when he's filming, he makes the entire crew and everything else, they're, 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 they all go vegan, or vegan in a dietary sense. Uh, and he, he will not sit down with somebody. He says that I wouldn't sit down, or I wouldn't be in the same room as somebody raping a child, so I'm not going to be in the same room as somebody digesting the dead body of a, a, an animal who wanted to live. So I can understand that. It, do, it is a bit isolationist, though, isn't it? So I think... I think it's a real dilemma. I think it's an interesting campaigning issue. Do we engage with people and kind of, as it were, meet them halfway? And that means sitting down, you know. At the same time, if we recognize what they're doing, it makes it difficult for vegans. So I can see there's a problem there. I mean, what do you think? All oh, right, okay. Well, we both don't know then. You. It's all that hospital food. <laughs> all right. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I, you raised some interesting points there, I, um, especially the enforcement part. Uh, essentially, I got a blog uh, entry which is kind of called a numbers game. And we are playing a kind of numbers game because a lot of people get frustrated um, that everybody they interact with don't go vegan or any, anywhere close. But we don't need everybody. We just need a certain percentage. Now, we don't know what that percentage is. So, some theories of social change would say 10%, others would say uh, it's kind of more than that. If there are people struggling with their family members in this audience, let me just say this as a sociologist. If that is the case, that's probably because you might be the worst person to talk to your family about this issue. In other words, they might be much more receptive to it if they were listening to it from a stranger. That's because when you're talking to them, there's a lot of family baggage, you know, and also, oh, I'm not going to let my little sister tell me this, that, or the other. You know, there's a lot of stuff like that. So sociologically, I know that it's very frustrating that you can't get through to your family, but it's actually quite hard sometimes. Yeah. But, you know, going back, I, I would say that in relation to forcing people, it is true. I used to have this concept called the militant meat eaters, and um, those people will have to be forced in the same way as you know, one most people kind of agree with the drink driving or using mobile phones in cars. There are some, the end people, the militant people, the kind of stubborn ones who have to be forced. That is true. We, we will probably have to use law. My own position on that is that in terms of vegan advocacy, we're far too early to go to law. I, I don't like politicians, I don't trust them. I've never met many good ones. And they're all in a system that kind of corrupts their values even if they're good in the first place. The culture is just not right at the moment. I would, I would suggest that we go for the population because politicians are followers. They describe themselves as leaders or prime movers, but really they're followers. They follow the votes and they follow the money. So it's not time for politics in, in, in my view.
Did I get it right then? Yeah, there also is a, there is a kind of like social psychological issue to, to that. It's much better, rather than banning something, is to get it to fizzle out. Because if you ban something, what you're doing is, is stopping people doing something they still want to do, like hunting, right? And so they find every loophole they can. I mean, the, 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 uh, the hunting law in England, Scotland, and Wales is, is a disaster, you know? I mean, it was... It was put forward by somebody who went fishing in the first place, full of loopholes, as we know, birds of prey and all, all the rest of it. And it was never about animal rights. I, I mean, I, I did all the TV stuff and the radio stuff in the 70s and 80s about hunting. We never talked about animal rights. It was all about things like pest control and animal welfare and, you know, c the controlling of, uh, of vermin and this kind of stuff, you know. Uh, so the other problem about politics is that politics and animal welfare that has a place for each other. Politics and animal rights is, won't mix because politicians cannot bring about anything that we could call animal rights. And the way, the way I describe it is through the work of a sociologist called Richard Gale. And normally when we talk about social movements, we then talk about their counter movements, social movements and counter movements. But there's also another relationship which is social movements, counter movements, and state or state agencies. What tends to happen is, if the social movement causes what I call kind of social turbulence, causes a bit of trouble, right? Give, give an example, they expose some terrible thing going on in a circus. And then the minister in, in control of all that gets a load of flack, either through the pr press or petitions or people phoning them up and everything. What they do is they, they contact the circus and they go, look, I'm getting a lot of shit here, do something. And the only thing they can do is say, okay, we'll tidy it up. So in these conversations, animal rights always slides into animal welfare every single time, which is why if you go outside a circus and you go, animal rights, animal rights, they come out and say, our circus is monitored by the RSPCA and they think it's brilliant. They always slide into welfare. Politics and rights don't mix in that sense. Well, there's a few things going on in the sense that we, we're now getting, as it were, animal rights friendly books. So there are kind of alternatives now. And in fact, that, that will probably become an interesting research question for uh, sociologists, for example, because you know, people like Ruby Roth and everything are now putting out kind of animal friendly uh, narratives, which children can be um, exposed to. Also, giving talks at, at schools is a good one, but that, again, is quite tricky. First of all, access is a problem. I, I give talks at schools in, in Ireland, but um, getting in there is quite difficult. And sometimes we've, we've had to give talk to five-year-olds. There's nothing much you can say then. We, you then kind of have to then talk about issues about being fair. And, you know, uh, we do talk about categories a little bit, but you can't, you can't give them the vegan animal rights thing. And also there's the issue about upsetting the parents. Um, which, is, which is always a big one. So even the groups like Animal Aid and people like that who do it all the time, they, they find that they have to tailor their message, obviously, to the audience, which, again, sociologically is just common sense. There's a, a concept called recipient design. So we're doing that all now. I'm designing what I want to say to the audience in front of me, you know, recipient design. I'm, I'm thinking about who's going to receive my message no, there's, there's, no, there's no point in us kind of talking past each other. But we're good social animals in that way. We do cater for each other. You know? That brings us to another 
issue that I just like to mention. I think we're maybe running out of time. I'm not sure. Um, when we, I use media sociology for this. When we give out a message, it's called encoding a message, and then the audience receive it. That's called decoding. Encoding and decoding. We can have control over what we encode as our message. So we can say, live vegan, be vegan, or the less attractive one for me is go vegan. Uh, but we can say all that, but we cannot, we cannot control what the audience does. So it's an interesting one, that. You know, there are a lot of people who are kind of um, opposed to, you know, that kind of re reducitarian things. Sometimes what might happen is somebody might say, go meat free Monday, and the audience, some of the audience might receive that and think, that doesn't make any sense, I'll go vegan. And, and the other way would be, go vegan, well, that doesn't make any sense, but I'll cut down. You, ca you can't control how the audience is going to decode your message. But what we can control is how we encode it, the message that we give out. And that's why VegFest is so good now, because they've got a strong vegan-only message. And my opinion is that if you're a vegan, then that's what you do. There are plenty of vegetarians. Let them do the vegetarian stuff. There are millions of reducitarians. Let them do the reducitarian things. What they tend to do is say, we want you vegans to do this work as well, usually because it's the vegans who are the activists. So they want to say, you know, will you do the veg stuff? And will you do the meat-free Monday? And you go... No, we're going to do the vegan stuff. We're vegans. You do that. There's more of you. There's more vegetarians than vegans. You do the bloody vegetarian stuff. You know, and there's tons more of the reducitarians. I don't see why any vegan should do anything less than vegan in terms of cultural work. And that means being honest to people. You don't be a politician and kind of hide what your position is. And you kind of like let them in gently to what it is. You actually say, because you believe that people can take your message. Say, our position is justice for all veganism. This is what it means. What do you think? And the other point to that is, if we don't propound that message, we'll never know how it's going to be received. Donald Watson said in 1944 that people have to be ripened up to new ideas. You don't wait for people to be ready for veganism you make them ready for veganism because it's a bit like advertising. You just keep going at them, giving them the concept, giving them the idea until they get used to it. And that's exactly what, when I went vegan, people couldn't even pronounce the word. At least they can now, m m mainly. People still say vegan and vegan and all the rest of this stuff sometimes. But most of people, they know what vegan is. They've got a general idea of what it means. When Peter Singer wrote Animal Liberation in 1975, he started off by saying... This is going to seem like a parody of the human liberation movement because, you know, he, 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 Singer's not a rightist, right? We, we know that. He, he doesn't stand for armor rights. Um, so he's a utilitarian, and he said, this is going to be a parody. But the idea of animal liberation now, nobody's going to laugh at that. But they did in those days, in the 70s. In the 1970s, the most well-known vegetarian restaurant in London was called Cranks. It's called Cranks. I mean, things have really moved on. You know, people know what vegan is. Then, you know, they're not going to laugh their socks off. They're not going to crap themselves by, at the word. They're going to be, you know, I, I say in my work in Dublin, with a lot of vegan curious people, they will sit down with you, and they've got lots of questions. You know, usual things, you know, where do you get protein from, and blah, 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 this, that, and the other. But they're not scared of it. There are people in the movement who suggest that veganism is a scare word. That's wrong. Veganism is not a scare word, and vegans should be the ones out there propounding it. Because the vegetarians are not going to campaign for veganism, and the reducitarians are not. We have to do it. We're the minority, we admit that. But, you know, don't get sidelined. Don't get distracted. Go for vegan. That's what we want, isn't it? Hmm. <laughs> You'd probably have to speak to the Vegan Society and Animal Aid for that, and Viva as well. Um, there's only a few. Uh, Dean Brasher was here yesterday. Uh, he's one of the main... Uh, I think he started with Animal Aid. He's now the Vegan Society guy. Uh, I think he's done... Um, I think he was saying 
2,000 talks or something, I think he was saying. Um, so there are some people out there. Um, as I said, access is the, is the problem I found. Getting access to the schools is quite, is quite a difficult thing. Because obviously, you know, they're, they're in kind of um, loco parentis, aren't they? They, they, they? They've got responsibility. So they're not going to invite people in who they think is going to upset the kids. You know, I, <laughs> I, did, I did a school talk once, and we had a call from the teacher about half an hour later because there was one kid who didn't see the connection between a cow and a hamburger. And when they did see it, he was actually very upset. And then the teacher rang me and said, don't worry, everything's grand. Uh, you know, the little chap is eating a ham, ham sandwich now, so everything's fine. You know, he's, he's settled down. <laughs> um, are, are we late? Uh, is it your turn? Okay. All right, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, if you, if you look at, there's a website called Animal, uh, if I remember it now, Animal Education Outreach. That's a Dublin one. And what, what we did was we looked at the Irish curriculum and we tailored our work to that. So we can talk to kids who are five right up to college ages in, in appropriate senses in relation to the level that they're at educationally and in relation to what they've been taught. You know, so, you know, like, for example, they do, like, citizenship type lessons when they get older and older those get more and more complicated you know they get you know and so again it's a little bit like this lecture we kind of gradually increase the sophistication of what we might say to them and that's the same in education so that, that's how you do it you would look at the curriculum and tailor tailor it to the age group you know and it, a lot of it is just common sense you know right i think uh, we might be done so thanks very much